Hello everyone, this is Brad Wistance. You are watching the first video in a series that will detail the adventures of a single staged, unrefueled space plane. This is actually a redo of one of the first KSP videos I put on YouTube. In that video I took a four rapier engined MK2 space plane to Lathe, Bop, Pole, and Minmus, all in a single stage without any refueling. This was a really fun criteria for a mission because it forced a lot of optimization during the design phase to give this craft as much Delta V as possible while still able to be landed on moons. And it also required every trick I knew at the time in terms of gravity assists and other maneuvers to reduce the amount of Delta V I was using. So it's been a couple years since that, so I figured I could do this mission maybe even a little better this time. So I went with the delete option on the rover that I used in that first mission and then added some ion engines that should give me some more Delta V. And we're going to see how many moons I can take this thing to before I run out of fuel and have to return home. Bill got perhaps a little carried away while driving the rover over to board, so I figured he better get into the plane and get launched before they ask him to fill out any time-consuming paperwork. One key factor in maximizing the amount of Delta V in a craft is minimizing the amount of dry mass. One of the big sources of dry mass is engines, and as a result, one key factor here was giving this craft as much launch mass per rapier engine as possible. Through aerodynamic optimizations, weight balancing, and other factors, I was able to get this to just over 28.5 tons per rapier engine, which is the highest amount I've managed to do in any craft I've made to date. One method used to optimize the aerodynamics on this craft was to minimize the amount of intakes used. This required me to be very careful while rolling out in the runway, and also required me to adjust my ascent profile and to actually back off in the throttle multiple times during the ascent. This isn't really that much of a problem, because for air breathing engines, it's most important to maximize your thrust during the early ascent, that is, under 350 meters per second, and during the final moments where you're using air breathing engines, where you're trying to reach as high a speed as possible before switching over to closed cycle, and limiting the amount of intake air available do not cause any problems during the critical parts of the air breathing ascent. As with most space plane ascents from Kerbin, efficiency is mostly a factor of minimizing how much closed cycle rocket burning happens. The aerodynamics of this craft will allow us to get going very fast while still just using the rapiers on air breathing mode. And then, because we have enough nuclear and ion engines to allow us to land on some moons and maybe some planets as well, we don't have to get all the way to orbital velocity while using the rapiers on closed cycle mode. As a result, the rocket fuel used by the rapiers on closed cycle mode is limited to about 56 tons. Despite this, this is still actually about half of the fuel we use to get to orbit, which shows how important it is to minimize this part of the ascent. After shutting off the rapier engines, we're now going to be doing the rest of the circularization with just the nuke engines and the ion engines. The nuclear engines, despite being efficient, are nowhere near as efficient as the ion engines, so we're going to use them just long enough such that we'll be able to circularize on the delta V left in the ion engines. Now when I say delta V left in the ion engines, what I mean is how much delta V we can do given the electrical charge we have left remaining. This craft uses the combination of battery banks and the RTGs to generate power over time. But the RTGs take a very long time to fill the battery banks. So now that we're operating on just the ion engines, we really only have the amount of electrical charge left in the battery banks available. Fortunately, math works, and we can see that when the ion engines run out of electrical charge, they're we are just about to orbit and we'll be able to do the final little bit of delta V that we need off of the small trickle from the RTGs. Fifteen minutes later, after the craft had already gone around the entirety of Kerbin once, the 16 RTGs finally had succeeded in getting the craft to orbit. Normally with a craft like this, I would let you guys know how much delta V we had from low Kerbin orbit. However, with this craft, this answer is going to depend dramatically on which order we use the ion versus the nuclear fuel in. So all I can say is that depending on which order we do this in, it's going to be somewhere between 15 and 20,000 meters per second. 
I should note that we don't get to just choose to use the nuclear fuel first to maximize this delta V, since we're going to need the additional TWR from the nuclear engines for some of the landings that we're going to do. So our first stop at this point is going to be Minmus. So to get there, we're going to need to do a very significant ejection burn. So for efficiency's sake, this is going to be split into many separate burns at periapsis. After many such burns, we finally achieved a rendezvous with the moon, which will allow for some additional savings by doing a gravity assist off of the moon that will push us the rest of the way to Minmus. In addition to decreasing the magnitude of the ejection burn, doing the gravity assist off of the moon also decreases the injection burn that's necessary to capture around Minmus. Between these two effects, we're looking at a combined total of about 130 meters per second savings just from doing a short gravity assist off of the moon. As a result of the gravity assist at the moon, our capture burn at Minmus is going to be less than 100 meters per second to low Minmus orbit. Normally we would capture into an equatorial orbit to minimize our surface velocity before descent, but we're going to put ourselves into an inclined orbit, which will allow us to land on Minmus's largest flats. As is common in KSP, there's going to be two competing factors that determine how we descend. First, we want to get as close to the surface of the flats as possible before seriously slowing down in order to minimize our delta V lost due to gravity. However, there are elevation gains all around the sides of the flats, so we don't want to come in too low or we will contact the ground in a non-friendly way. So our goal is to approach the flats while just clearing the hills around the outside so we can quickly get down as close to the surface as possible, which minimizes our altitude when we begin to burn retrograde in seriousness. The reason why we have gone through all this effort to land on the flats is that we can touch down at high speed and then use wheel brakes to perform the rest of the delta V, which is essentially free delta V resulting in fuel savings. After touching down and starting to break, the plane turned sideways rather earlier than I had hoped, but somehow still managed to stay stable enough to not overturn, and we began to slowly come to a stop. And this slowly was just fast enough as we came to a stop just before running off the edge of the flats, which could have been disastrous. Now safely on the surface, it was time for Bill to get out and do the obligatory look around. He doesn't have a flag to plant here because we only have one flag for the whole mission, since as tradition dictates, we have furnished Bill with only a chair rather than a proper cabin. With all due ceremony on the surface of Minmus observed, it was time to get ready to head to our next destination. One advantage of landing on the flats is that they're also a great place to take off from. To maximize the efficiency of our ascent, we're going to taxi over to a point on the flats that'll give us the longest straight line along the flats before we hit some mountains. Since this taxing is going to take quite some time, I'm going to call this the end of episode one. Before I close out, I'd like to note that I have not already flown the rest of this mission, and I'll be updating the episodes as I actually fly the mission. Although I've attempted to account for everything, and I believe I've been successful, something could happen that results in the mission coming to an unforeseen close. Hopefully that'll add to the excitement, and we won't actually have to end the mission early. And you'll also be able to share my concern over the steadily declining fuel levels, because while I've attempted to calculate the delta V as best I could, some of this involved what we can call estimates. So as a result, I'm not 100% sure how many different moons we're going to be able to land on in this mission. If you think you have a good guess, or you want to guess what our next destination is going to be, feel free to leave that in the comments. I hope that everyone's enjoyed the video very much. Please like and subscribe for more. And keep an eye out for episode two.